Samuel 5. And uh, in our last study, there was this war that had been going on between Israel to the north, which was basically all of the tribes except for Judah, and then David and, and Judah. So Ishbosheth was the king of, of Israel, and then David over his own tribe of Judah. Well, that war ended last time we saw that. And remember, as part of that, Abner, who had been like the military leader, right hand man of uh, Ishbosheth, he's the one that kind of went around and convinced everybody to join with David. <laughs> Ishbosheth upset him, and that was the, the final fatal mistake because then he went and said, hey, we should all follow David instead. Uh, but then both Abner and Ishbosheth were killed, and so neither one of them lived to see this reunification of all of Israel under David. And that's what we're going to see today. We're going to see David is made king over all of uh, the nation of Israel. And this is uh, at least 12 years after his anointing from the Lord to become king. <laughs> so probably a little more than that, but 12 years uh, we know for certain uh, because 10 years on the run and two years now that, that uh, he and Ishbosheth have been at war. But as we look at David's new role from the Lord, which is to be king, we're all gonna we're gonna draw some parallels for how God works in our lives as well from these pages and from these verses. David's call from God, uh, David's you know God's plan for David was for him to be a king. That was God's plan for David's life. But likewise, God puts a call on our lives, and God has a plan for our lives today. Anyone who is in Christ. And we're going to see how uh, to apply these same sort of things to our lives today. So let's read from 2 Samuel 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be a ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. Then they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And so David at last is anointed king, is what we see here. The, the people make good on their promises to Abner that they're going to make David their king over all their tribes. And so to accomplish that, the elders of the nation come to David. These are, we understand, the leaders of the various tribes of Israel. They all come to David to seal the deal here. And uh, in, they come to him at Hebron. Remember, that's the place that David was ruling from in Judah, was in the city Hebron, which uh, is not a real familiar to us. You know, it's not a city we hear much about other than the verses we've been reading here. Uh, but that's where his initial uh, kingdom was set up, or his initial uh, reign or palace or whatever you want to say, although he didn't really build a palace there. That's where he was living. And so the elders come to him and they present, you know, making David king is just a logical thing to do. I don't know if you followed their logic there. Uh, the first thing they say is, you know, David is our kin. You know, he's our bone and flesh. You know, you're, you're an Israelite, so you have the right to be king. Uh, and then they note that David is the one that led them in victory, that, that led them uh, out and in, it says. And they recognize that, that during Saul's reign, before Saul turned against David, David was actually having all these military successes for Saul and for the kingdom of Israel. And then finally, they acknowledge that God is, has said, you will be king. You know, you're the one that will shepherd Israel. And so that's the most important reason, isn't it? I mean, that's the reason they really needed to latch on to. But that's sort of their logic for, yes, this makes sense that you become king. And so they make a covenant with David there. And commentators suggest that there was probably actually a written document of this covenant between David and the elders, uh, much like uh, Saul had done earlier in 1 Samuel. So David is now leader of Israel at last, after so long, you know, he's waited for this. And uh, he starts his reign there in Hebron, like we said, but soon it's going to be Jerusalem. And he's going to reign from the ages of 30 to 70. So 40 years, he's going to reign over Israel. Israel. 
as king then over Israel, he is now Israel's military leader. He's going to lead all of their army, the armies that's composed of all the various tribes, not just Judah anymore. He's also the governmental leader. He's going to be the one who keeps order in the land, you know, kind of like the top cop or whatever. You know, he's going to make sure there's order within the nation. And though he's not replacing the priests and the Levites, he's also a spiritual leader over the nation. And we look at David and we think, yeah, well qualified. You know, I mean, wrote all these Psalms, you know, <laughs> amazing man. I mean, God even wrote prophecies through him. So good guy to have as your spiritual leader. And because the people are going to look to him as an example, even though, again, he's not replacing the priests and the Levites and all that that God's established. But the kings would have great influence over Old Testament Israel when you look at the, the pages of Scripture. If you study, for example, in First and Second Kings, you can see how However the king was going, that's how the nation went too. You know, if there was a godly king there, then the nation uh, would be inspired to, to commit themselves to the Lord and to follow the Lord. But when they had an ungodly king, well, they, they would just plunge them into the depths of sin and idolatry. You know, I mean, the, the nation would just follow whatever way that king uh, was leading. That's the way they tended to follow as, uh, as a whole. There would always be exceptions, of course. This reminds us, too, that as Christians, anyone who's a believer in Christ, that you know, we're spiritual leaders as well, and we have influence around us as a result. Uh, you know, being a spiritual leader is not limited to having some formal position of leadership in a church or a ministry or something like that. It's not limited simply to those who are married. We think about the husband as to be the spiritual leader in the home or to those who have young children, as the parents being spiritual leaders of their children. But all of us, if you're a Christian, and the world knows you're a Christian, they're going to look to you as a spiritual leader. They look to you as a measuring stick for what right behavior is. Now, some of them are looking to you because they're anxious to see a failure on your part. So they can say, oh, you know, see, look, hypocrites. They're hypocrites in the church. But they're still looking to you as a standard. They're still evaluating the way you're living. They're watching you closer than anyone else. Others uh, look for failures in your walk in the Lord because they feel like that's a license for sin. You know, I know, you know, Sally over here and she's a believer and she, you know, does this and that. So I guess it's okay, you know, if I do this and that too. You know, they do that sort of thing, that kind of math. Because again, they're looking at Christians as this measuring stick whether they'll you know, admit that to you or not. How, as believers, don't we want to be a, a perfect representation of Christ? That's what we really want, isn't it? Now, we know we're not perfect. We'll never be completely perfect. But that's what we want. We want to really shine His light in such a, an, an awesome way to show who He really is. And so that rather than others being encouraged to sin by our testimony and by our witness, that they would be convicted of their sin. And they would turn to Jesus and be forgiven of their sin. That's what we desire. David is also the diplomatic leader of his nation. He's the one who is going to be in communication with other nations. And we, we pick up on this. We're going to skip ahead to verse 11 of 2 Samuel 5. It says, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons. And they built a house for David. And David realized that the Lord had, escaped, had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And so, you know, this king of, of Tyre, he wants to form a, an alliance with David. You know, he wants to be on good terms with David. So he says, I'm going to build him a house. You know, he pays tribute to David here. I mean, what a blessing. This guy just says, I'm going to send all this expensive cedar, and I'm going to send a building crew. You got plenty of stone there in Israel. I know that. So we're going to build you a house right there uh, in your kingdom. <clears throat> and this was an expensive gift that he was given, obviously. Tyre was a Phoenician seaport on a, a small island in the Mediterranean Sea just off the coast there. And part of what enriched the city, because it was a very rich city, was the export of cedar from Lebanon. So that's where all this cedar wood would have come from. And, you know, David sees this and <clears throat> he says in verse 12 that he realizes that the Lord had established him as king at that point. You know, it's like he sees that and just his response is, this is the Lord. You know, this guy is building me a palace. <laughs> this is the Lord at work here. 
And, you know, it's funny because we know David's recognized God's hand in his life before. If you look back to chapter 4, verse 9, as an example, towards the end of the verse, <clears throat> David says there, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all distress. And so he knows that God's been at work in his life, that God's been the one, you know, taking care of him and, and even now establishing him as king. But it's like when David sees this, what this king does, it took it to another level. You know, it took it to another level in his eyes to see how God was really working. The Lord just built him a palace through this distant king that previously he probably had no idea who he was. You know, and this person wants to form an alliance and build a palace for him. And, you know, don't we have moments like this in our lives too as believers? I mean, we all know that, you know, God loves us. We're aware of that. We were so aware of that the day we got saved. Um, but, you know, then God, you know, years later, does something special in your life. You know, there's some answer to prayer, some big thing that you've been looking for, and God does it. And you're just like, wow. And it just magnifies your knowledge of His love for you all over again. It's like all over again. I recognize, you know, that God is in this thing, that God is working in my life. And I love those, those times like that. And so David, back to David here, he's, he's risen to the peak of his leadership now. I mean, he's over all the nation. We should note, though, how David made that ascension to leadership. Notice that it, it started with God's plan for David, with God showing David his plan for him. It didn't start with people coming to David and saying, we want to make you king. And he's like, okay. You know, who are you? What is this? It didn't start that way. It started with God telling David, you're going to be king. It started from God, not from people. And that's how we look for God to work in our lives as well. That's, that's a principle I would suggest for uh, we can take away from this of how God works in our life, that we look to God to establish those calls in our life for what he has for us to do. And then as we step out in faith, he does bring confirmation then, often through other people, like he was doing for David, with all them making him kings. Like, hey, I believe I'm supposed to be king. Well, if no one makes you king, probably not. You know, but if they establish you as king, yes, that's confirming what God's already said. Uh, and so we see that in our own lives too. Like maybe it is an area of spiritual leadership, and you feel like God's given me that gift, that spiritual gift of leadership. And then maybe an, uh, you know, some spiritual leader in your life, in a ministry or a church or something, asks you to enter into leadership. You're like, okay, confirmation. You know, that, that is, the Lord has been telling me that. Uh, another way you see that, if you do have that gift of leadership, is you notice that other people are following your lead. That's a good clue that you have the gift of leadership. If other people are just kind of naturally following you, and I mean in the church, that is not necessarily in the workplace. But other ministry uh, areas, too, we see this. You know, we see that uh, we feel like we're gifted in a certain area, and we see that God keeps bringing opportunities in that area. Maybe you feel like you have the gift of evangelism, and you're constantly finding yourself in conversations where you can share the gospel with people. Well, that's good confirmation of that gifting you have and of that call that you have. As we obey, then, God, in that call that He's given us, we then experience the joy of serving the Lord. And we see fruit from that. We see fruit in our own lives. We see fruit in the lives of other people. And God is just, again, confirming His call on our lives. Let's, can, let's look back at David then. Let's go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 6, where we see that David is going to conquer their Jerusalem. Now the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. And they said to David, You shall not come in here, but the blind and lame will turn you away, thinking David cannot enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. David said on that day, Whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him reach the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, through the water tunnel. Therefore they say, The blind or the lame shall not come into the house. So David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the millow and inward. David became greater and greater, for the Lord God of hosts was with him. And so uh, 
this is actually in Jerusalem is probably where it would have been actually where Hiram builds that house for David. We read ahead a little bit ago about Hiram building a house for David that would have been built there in Jerusalem. Uh, but the Jebusites here had been a problem for Israel for a long time. It's kind of surprising to us to think about Jerusalem actually being occupied by someone else. I mean, automatically think of Jerusalem is where you know the Israelites would have control of that city, but they didn't always. Uh, way back here, the Jebusites had control of it, and they they had been this continual problem for Israel. They initially were conquered by Joshua when they uh, came into Canaan and overtook the land. Uh, that included the Jebusites were were. Uh, conquered, including the city of Jerusalem. But the Jebusites regrouped and they made Jerusalem their capital. And Joshua 15 verse 63 tells us of how the nation of Judah, or the tribe of Judah, I should say, tried to remove the Jebusites from Jerusalem, because this is inside of Judah, this is where Jerusalem is, but they were unsuccessful. They couldn't get them out of there. And then in Judges chapter 1 <clears throat> verse 21, tribe of Benjamin also tries to remove the Jebusites from Jerusalem and cannot do it. And so the Jebusites, by this point, they're feeling pretty confident. You know, they're, they were a warlike people themselves. They were warriors to begin with. Uh, but seeing all these past victories over Israel, like, oh yeah, David's going to try and take us. Okay, come on. You know, and they're, they're just so confident that they're not even going to send like they're, they're real soldiers. You know, they, they taunt David here and suggesting that those who are clearly ill-equipped for military service, for battling and such, the lame and the blind, as they say, that that's all we're going to need to hold off David. You know, we don't have to send in our soldiers. We'll just send in, you know, these people who have, have difficulty just with normal life, let alone battling in an army. David's response to that in verse 8 is, you know, whoever wants to go after these lame and blind, quote-unquote, you know, let them do so by the water tunnel. And let's describe Jerusalem a little bit so you understand what David's saying there. Jerusalem sits atop two mountains, and it has deep ravines all around it. And that, that's why it's so hard to conquer. I mean, it made it a very defensible position. I mean, you've got to get across those deep ravines, and then you're going up a mountainside, right, to get to the city. And so that made it a very good place strategically to protect, but it's not a great place for water. You know, you don't get a lot of water on the top of a mountain. <laughs> you know, that's not a good place for it. And so to provide uh, the city a water source, especially in the case of a siege, uh, they had developed this elaborate system of shafts and tunnels that directed water from the Gihon Spring and the Kidron Valley below up into the city. Apparently the spring, uh, you know, fires off daily. And when it does, it has such force, they could, they could get the water all the way up into the city to give them a water source. And so David is saying, you know, we're going to attack them from within by going up this channel that the water goes and attack them. And that's exactly what they did. They came up through all that system of tunnels and got into the city and then attacked from within. And it wasn't too difficult for them to conquer them in a surprise attack from inside the city like this. Um, and so David then, we see in verse 9, David goes ahead and he starts to really put his mark on the city immediately. Uh, you know, he renames the city the City of David. And, you know, that's kind of weird to us, you know, name a city after yourself. But this was something that the Middle Eastern kings would do at that time often. They would name the capital after themselves. So they called it the city of David. And he starts all these construction projects there uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, it says he did so from the millow, which that is basically the foundation. So starting at the foundation, we're going to just really build up this city. And it seems like he probably actually even built out the foundation, so made it a wider, a larger area that the city now covered. But verse 10 reminds us that David could have had no uh, impact on that city at all were it not for God's favor, that the Lord God of hosts was with him. And that was the key point. And that's another principle that we see in our lives, of God's working in our lives too. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 17, I'll paraphrase, James 1, 17 tells us that any good thing in our lives comes down from God. It came from the Father of lights. And so we must never lose sight of that in our lives. The less, uh, you know, pride enter into us. And, you know, pride then renders us useless really for the work of God. When we become prideful and start to 
feel like things that are being done that are actually the Lord, we start to try and say they're our own things, that we did these things. It's a surefire way to quench the work of the Spirit in our ministry and our lives to try and take credit for what God's doing. And so the principle there uh, may be said more clearly is that the glory for anything that happens must be given to God because it really is His glory. It's not about the servant. It's about the one who's really doing the work, the Lord. As we read on, though, in 2 Samuel 5, starting at verse 13, we're going to see more just abundance in David's life as we're going to see his family is going to grow after he has taken over Jerusalem here. Uh, verse 13 says, Meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to David. Now these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ivar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphlet. And so this is another sign of David's success that it lists these 11 more children that, that David has in Jerusalem, that, that he is father of there in Jerusalem. Most notably in this list is Solomon. That's the one that we all recognize right off as Solomon, who will be David's heir to the throne eventually. And the fact that Solomon is listed here gives us a clue that this is a summary of all the children that David's going to have there in Jerusalem, he and his wives, of course, because Solomon's birth won't actually occur until chapter 12. And so it's just giving a, a you know, kind of a looking back and saying, look, here's all the children he had there. So it's looking forward to what's going to happen. Uh, it's not like he had all these children in one year you know, or something like that. Uh, it's pointing ahead. Now, <clears throat> we discussed previously of how marriage uh, in those days, marriage to a king, was often a form of diplomacy that was done. It was to show there was an alliance that, that you know, the king would say, look, I even married your daughter. You know, so we're, you know, we're together. You know, I married, I married your daughter. She's part of my household now. And so David then was doing that. He was marrying all these women of Jerusalem. And that would have been to secure some solidarity with the prominent families in the area. And say, look, we're one, we're united, we're together. Uh, but the question we have is, it says that he had... Uh, concubines and wives. Now, why might some be called wives and others concubines? I don't know if you ever had that question in your mind. Uh, because what is, what is a concubine in the end? A concubine was, was really a wife, but of lower rank in the household. In this case, uh, they likely would have been Jebusite women that he married. That's why they were called concubines and not wives. The wives would have been the women of you know, the, the Jewish people in that city. Because the law did allow for uh, marrying amongst the defeated people like this. You read about it, uh, for example, in Deuteronomy 21, uh, starting around verse 10. Deuteronomy 21, verse 10. And so they could you know, take from those defeated people like this and, and have these concubines. And though, though they were married, <clears throat> the concubines couldn't share in like the governing of the household. So they had a lesser position in the household. It was also much easier for a husband to reject a concubine than it was uh, their normal wives. And so in all of that, the law, the law allowed for these things, but we shouldn't take from that that the law was praising this sort of thing to be done. Because as we've studied previously, the king was to have one wife. And it makes it very clear that the king was to have one wife, not to have multiplied wives like this. So thus far, we've seen only more and more success for David in his call from the Lord to be king. But in any ministry that we have from the Lord, and if you've walked with the Lord very long and been involved with ministry, you know that there's going to be testing along the way. There's going to be some testing that comes. And that's what we're going to see next in David's calls. There's going to be some testing of that call. Let's read from 2 Samuel 5, verse 17. <clears throat> When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek out David. And when David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines came and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. Then David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So David 
came to Baal Perazim and defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore he named that place Baal Perazim. They abandoned their idols there, so David and his men carried them away. <clears throat> and so this testing of David's uh, call comes to the Philistines. The Philistines attack <laughs> is what happens. Uh, these had been David's allies just you know a little bit ago, like at the end of 1 Samuel. But now they see David as an enemy. Remember, they, they had thought that David you know, was, would be angry at Saul and so you know, upset about that that he, would, he became their ally and he would help them conquer Israel. And then they would be like, all this land is the Philistine land. But now David's reigning over Israel you know, instead of conquering Israel. And so now they see him as the enemy. And so they align for battle in this valley of Rephaim. And this is a valley near to Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, along the road to Bethlehem. So it was a very strategic place because basically it could kind of cut off Jerusalem from the rest of Judah and from like their supply lines. And so that's why they chose that. It's like, we're going to block them here. It's like a blockade or something. And so it forces David's hand. You know, he's going to have to do something about this. And David's response then is what, exactly what we'd expect. As long as we've been looking at David, you know, and we've been studying him, it's exactly what we'd expect him to do in the face of danger. And then in verse 19, David seeks the Lord. It's exactly what we would expect of David to do. He seeks the Lord. And one of the things about that, when we read uh, that verse, is it shows kind of like this dialogue that David just seems to ask questions and get kind of a verbal response from the Lord. Um, but, you know, we must understand that really the way this was done, this is just sort of the author kind of consolidating it or condensing, you know, what happened there. But what actually would have happened is David would have been using the Urim and Thummim, those two stones that the priest had, the high priest had, that would give a yes-no answer, that they would use those to get yeses and nos. And so through a sequence of questions of asking over and over and getting yes, no answers. That's how it kind of pieces together into this conversation that we see before us. So I just want to make sure that's clear, that that's how David really was hearing from the Lord. But this is another principle in our lives as we follow the Lord, as we follow His call in our lives, is that we never forget our dependence on Him. Think about who David is. I mean, David, at this point in his life, he's a very accomplished warrior all the way back from killing Goliath you know as a boy to now he's a very accomplished military leader I mean I you know I didn't search real closely before this study but as I recall as our study in first Samuel and second Samuel so far I can't remember a defeat that's happened of David you know he's been you know incredibly successful as both warrior and military leader and yet uh, though he's had so much success he remembers where that success has ultimately come from. He remembers that it's from the Lord. It's because he's been following the Lord and seeking his direction. And that's so important that we recognize that too. As we walk in God's uh, will in our lives, undoubtedly we're going to see some success. You know, if we're following the Lord, if we're doing things the way he wants, we're going to see some success as a result. And, and that will give us confidence. But that confidence needs to be in the Lord. We need to make sure that confidence is in the Lord and not in ourselves. And it doesn't become sort of self-reliance. We need to stay in that place of dependence on God, looking for His direction, even in those areas where we've been successful. And I think that sometimes can be the hardest thing. You know, when it's like a new challenge, we are, oh, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do here. But, you know, when it's an area where we've had success in the past, sometimes we can just sort of lean on our own uh, understanding and such. And so David seeks the Lord, and David now sees victory then in verses 20 and 21, as we just read. Um, the victory is so great that David you know, renames the place to Baal Perazim. And Baal Perazim means uh, literally the Lord breaks out, is what it means. Just like he said there, like it was a breakthrough of waters. Uh, it's interesting when it says Baal Perazim, we recognize, you know, the word Baal there or Baal there, however you like to pronounce that. And uh, so the Lord in that name is not Yahweh, which is what normally we think of when we see Lord in the Old Testament. It's not that Lord, it's just Lord like the general word Lord. Uh, 
And he's saying like a tidal wave, God basically wiped out our enemy here. To the extent that it told us in verse 21 that the Philistines uh, abandoned their idols. It said they abandoned their idols there. So David and his men carried them away. And, you know, this is very symbolic, is what this is, of the fact that, you know, Israel's God is superior to their false gods. That <laughs> They just left their idols and ran, you know. Here's your God, and you're leaving it behind. You know, if he's powerful and, and so important, you think you would take it with you. But it just shows how much more powerful uh, God, the true God, really is. And it reminds us of how in 1 Samuel 4, when the Philistines uh, had conquered Israel, they took away the Ark of the Covenant. They're like, we got your God now. We're taking your God, you know. And they thought that was a real blessing until the Ark, you know, God used the Ark to be a curse on them. They returned it, you know, because he was causing so much trouble for them, more trouble than the Israelites had, uh, just by his own work and his own presence there. But the Philistines, it turns out, are not so easily discouraged after this first loss. And like the trials in our lives and in our, our ministry, uh, they're often our repeats. You know, much to our frustration, there are often repeats of trials. And that's what happens here. The Philistines attack again. Let's read 2 Samuel 5, starting at verse 22. Now the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. When David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go directly up. Circle around behind them and come at them in front of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall act promptly. For then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Then David did so, just as the Lord had commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. So the Philistines align in the Valley of Rephaim again. And we talked about why that was a strategic place for them to do that. And David again seeks the Lord just like, you know, he should have done and like we hope to do in our lives too. And it highlights again that need for us not to be self-confident, but to continue to seek God's leading. That's exactly what David did. Because David would have been tempted to think here, hey, this just happened. God gave me a good game plan before. Let's just go with it. You know, I don't need to seek the Lord again. That's obvious, right? I mean, just do the same thing. But isn't it good that David didn't think that way? You know, he saw God out and God says, no, different battle plan this time. Instead of a frontal attack, uh, you're going to go around behind them and attack from behind this time. But don't do so until you hear the sound of marching in these balsam trees. Now, what exactly was this marching that he heard, that David heard, and I assume his men heard, doesn't really tell us. Uh, but it reminds me of the account uh, from the Aka Indians in Ecuador back in 1956. You remember the story of the American missionaries, including Jim Elliott, who were there to minister to the Aka Indians and ended up being slaughtered by them. Uh, but the thing is, when that took place, the Indians saw angels in the treetops and it freaked them out. You know, they had, this had never happened before when they had killed someone that they saw angels, you know, like this. And that's what ended up to their, leading to their conversion of them getting saved because they knew they'd really done something wrong and there was something powerful going on here, you know, and they needed to find out what it was. So maybe it was angels in the time of David. Maybe it was angels in those treetops. Maybe it was just the wind making some kind of noise up there that sounded like you know, uh, people walking in the treetops. But either way, it was the Lord working. Because the Lord said, wait until this happens. Wait until I do this. So we know it was the Lord working. We just don't know exactly what way he did it. He caused that sound then as a sign to David. And David obeys, follows God's new plan, and has another great victory. Uh, in fact, this time the victory looks even greater because they pursue the Philistines to Geba and Gezer, which is like on the coast. I mean, they went a long way after them into their own territory, uh, at least 15 miles from where the battle started. So in this chapter, we, we've seen how the Lord has established David as king over Israel. And we've also seen some points that we can apply in our walk with the Lord today. And I want to just review those points as we bring it to a close. Uh, the first was that we look first to God for that ministry call He has for us, 
for that call in our lives, for His will, if you will. Secondly, then, that we uh, will find confirmation of that call, even through other people. Uh, we'll find confirmation. Thirdly, we give God the glory for any success that we have. Fourth, that we can expect difficulty in our call. Don't we wish that when the Lord's, you know, showed us His will that it was just easy peasy after that? But that is not the case. Oftentimes there's difficulty and more testing in His will. That's just how the Lord works in our lives and how He draws us nearer to Him. And finally then, uh, the fifth point was that we remain dependent upon God in that call, especially after we've had some success uh, in our ministry. As we saw with David, God's plan is not always the same as in past successes, so we need to keep that dependence on Him. And I believe as we do these things, like David, we're going to see victory in the Lord in those areas that He calls us to. Let's close in with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful always for your word and for how it instructs us and, and how you just bring it to life, Lord, seeing all that you did in, in the life of David and seeing how that applies to us. Lord, like David, we want to follow you and that call you have for us. We want to walk in your perfect will for us. And we pray that you would make that clear to us, and that you would work in and through our lives just as we talked about today. In Jesus' name, amen.